the sensory signal, which we're always trying to do by giving people things like gabapentin or even opioids, uh, maybe we should stop the step before that, which is to stop the stress or the brain's perception of stress that then triggered the pain flare. So that's, that's the idea of the studies. This figure shows something you may or may not be aware of. So there's a nerve called the vagus. Let's see if, this, if I can get this thing to work. Oh, I oh, got that. Thank you. So, and you just press this button. Or this one. Oh, I'm pointing at myself. There we go. Thank you. So, uh, you've probably all heard of a nerve called the vagus nerve, which comes from the brain stem and goes uh, from the brain stem all the way to all of our internal organs. And one of the things it does is to control inflammation. So it, it connects to the splenic nerves, it connects over to the spleen here to a special population of white cells that then control the inflammatory response. And this pathway is so powerful that um, if you stimulate the vagus nerve in people who have rheumatoid arthritis who are refractory to all normal treatments, they go into remission almost immediately. So this is now a clinical trial that has been completed. And uh, there's no question that the vagal anti-inflammatory pathway is probably the most powerful uh, inflammation stopper that we have. Uh, so that, that's then, and, and no one really knows where in the brain this comes from, but we think it comes from an area called the periaqueductal gray region. So when, if you study women with endometriosis, some women with endometriosis have chronic pain, and some women with endometriosis do not have chronic pain. And people have studied for years the properties of the endometriosis itself and have never been able to find any difference. But uh, a uh, woman in Michigan did a study and she found that the part of the brain that stops pain signals called the periaqueductal gray region, this part of the brain, grows to very large proportions in the women who don't have pain. So in other words, that part of the brain, the pain-stopping part of the brain, is doing its job in the women that don't have pain. It's not doing its job in the women that do have pain. And if you think back at those pictures of the swords through the cheek, you know, it's hard to forget those pictures. We actually are, have some level of control over the, uh, over the descending pathways that uh, alter whether pain is... Um, being transmitted or not. So that's kind of what got us started on this whole thing. Um, now, a way to study the vagus is just to determine whether the heart is being modulated properly or not. And if you look at this, these are people that have chronic pain. And uh, so this is HD stands for healthy controls. This just came out maybe a month ago. And these are uh, kids who have a pain disorder called functional gastrointestinal disorder, such as irritable bowel syndrome, cyclic vomiting, any of these. And you can see that uh, the vagal inputs in the kids with a uh, painful disorder is much, much less than it is in the healthy controls. And this is uh, lying flat and standing up. So uh, that's one way of looking at the vagus. And uh, the ice can, which compares these two disorders, which is myofascial pelvic pain and bladder pain syndrome, is looking to see whether if we stop the autonomic nervous system manifestation of the flare, in other words, the stress response, does the pain improve? So I'm just sort of, I want to put that back together for you because there clearly probably is a connection, a very tight connection between your body's stress the inflammatory response, and the pain flare. And we think that's the direction it goes. And if this is true, that's going to give us a whole new insight uh, as to what is actually a pain flare. Now, so these are the aims. Uh, I'm not going to go through those. This is another way of stimulating the vagus. So you could stimulate the vagus using a little uh, a microauricular stimulator, which we use in our practice. And that's available in, in Europe as well. Um, I don't know, oh, okay. 
And uh, so that little device reduces migraines, it reduces nausea, it reduces pain. Uh, but here's the important point. Other ways to re increase vagus function are exercise. So resistance training reduces uh, white blood cell counts. It reduces the uh, markers of inflammation. Uh, and it improves um, uh, vagal modulation. Uh, other ways include acupuncture, yoga, and everything you've heard today, most of it is going to improve vagal function. So don't just think exercise is a way of improving your general well-being. It is, but actually it's, very, it's a very focused method that allows you to um, change the way the brain programs are working such that pain no longer produces such an impact. Now, the last thing I wanted to answer, just because I, have, I happen to have the information, somebody asked a question about low-dose naltrexone. Well, it turns out, low-dose naltrexone, which is the opposite of morphine, so naltrexone blocks morphine, blocks opioids, it's exactly the same thing. It turns out that low-dose naltrexone is an anti-inflammatory agent. The reason opioids are so bad, and if you're on one, I'd like to convince you today that you need to come off, they are pro-inflammatory. So they enhance the inflammatory response, and they produce, they increase the amount of pain. A toll-like receptor was named, it's a German name, because when they saw the receptor, it behaved in such a funny way, they said, oh, das ist toll, which means this is like crazy. And so, um, so, it's, it's wild, and so those are the receptors that mediate some of the most powerful inflammatory responses in our body. Actually, they're so powerful they can put you in the intensive care units. Well, guess what? Um, morphine binds to these very strongly and actually produces destruction of your synapses. So the, here's the receptor, and naltrexone or naloxone actually stop that inflammatory response. So I think, I prescribe low-dose low naltrexone frequently because I think it's very important. Um, now, let's go on to the next portion of the talk, which is about pregnancy. So now you're no longer the 28-year-old with chronic pain. You're healthy, and you're 33 years old, and you're expecting your first child. You have hypermobility, EDS, and you come into the doctor's office about six weeks after your pregnancy has begun. Um, and you still have some hip dislocation, uh, but otherwise you're fit, you swim five times a week, you're doing some closed chain exercises in addition to that, uh, and the doctor finds your exam to be unremarkable, everything, lo everything looks good. So if you're this patient, what would you like to know, and what do you think the doctor would be recommending? So let's look at some data regarding this. So what are the rates, what are the risks of becoming pregnant if you have EDS? So this particular study, remember this is the same study we started with, uh, then asked all these women, okay, have you had issues with, I'll go on this slide uh, just so I can be fair to that part of the room, asked all these women, I can't really see, sorry. So um, uh, had they had any uh, 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 preterm births? spontaneous abortions, ectopic pregnancies, or, or were they infertile? And what they found was that in Ehlers-Danlos, uh, the old nomenclature, they had 25% uh, uh, percent had a preterm birth compared to 11% in the general population. Spontaneous abortion was very high. Ectopic pregnancy was about two, two to three times higher, and infertility was very high. So that's one set of data, but hold on. Uh, I don't want you to take this home, okay? This is, this is a retrospective questionnaire study. Let's look at what, some, what someone else might have seen. So this divides between the different types, and I don't think we need to spend time on that. It's really, they're, they're, they're pretty similar across the different types of EDS with some variation. So their recommendation based on that was, okay, we should get an early ultrasound, make sure the pregnancy is where we think it is, in the uterus, and we should monitor the cervical length in the second trimester because cervical laxity might be the source of some of these problems. 
Uh, oh, sorry, and other recommendations were to get an infertility evaluation if you're not fertile and get preconception and genetic counseling. Now, so that's, these are two very different studies. That is a retrospective study asking a bunch of people who are a convenient sample. Convenient sample means that they just the people that happen to answer a questionnaire, so it's biased. They're, people who would like to answer questionnaires are different than people who don't like to answer questionnaires, and you may have reasons why you like to answer questionnaires. So this is a Swedish study that uh, looked at the same question but took a very different lens. What they did is they just looked through the insurance records of the Swedish, because the Swedish has a national health service, so you can look at this very easily. And you can see their control comparison is pretty robust, over a million women. And they, ha they identified 314 women with uh, Ehlers-Danlos. Uh, and they concluded, based on those records, there was absolutely no evidence of preterm birth, premature rupture of membranes, cesarean section, stillbirth, low APGAR scores, or small or large for gestational age. So this is a pretty good sample as well, but the difference is this sample is based on a physician's diagnosis. The other one is based on self-selection, someone who may have been given a diagnosis by a physician but may not. Uh, this, uh, this study looked, it's called the Mother's Outcome and Delivery Study. This was designed specifically to look at the rate at which people would develop prolapse after they delivered. So that, that was the point of the study, not to do with Ehlers-Danlos when they started out the study, they just wanted to know that, but of course, they were doing Biden scores on everybody and they were doing some other uh, assessments so they could tell who actually had Ehlers-Danlos and who did not. So they had about uh, 1,011 women and they picked the 600 or so who entered the second stage of labor because they wanted to know in this group who entered the second stage of labor, do they have more prolapse after delivery? And uh, so you can see here that uh, one of the things that they found was that the risk of having a C-section was actually higher if you were not hypermobile, right? So it's so higher if you're not hypermobile. Uh, you're more likely to have a spontaneous vaginal birth if you're hypermobile. And uh, the, the, um, uh, the statistically significant finding was that um, you're more likely to have anal sphincter laceration if you're not hypermobile. Well, why would that be? Well, that might be because you have more laxity in the pelvis. So you're not fighting the delivery of the baby quite so uh, so strongly, and that was actually their hypothesis. Their hypothesis was they were going to find exactly what they found. Um, so they had fewer operative interventions overall. Um, so what does the literature tell us then about as, oh wow, okay. <laughs> I'm going a lot slower than I was last time because I added that material, so all right, I'll buzz on through. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, the literature is very controversial. I believe the prospective study, that's, because that's a way more solid scientific study. So from my perspective, if I were counseling the person, I would say, look, we don't know of any major risk uh, right now. The questions may be still open. Uh, I would definitely follow the recommendations, get an early ultrasound, confirm the intrauterine pregnancy, and as they said, monitor the cervical length, cervical length in the second, second trimester, but I would not get worried about having uh, a pregnancy. Now, uh, so, okay, and that just summarizes the, that. Um, and so why is it, what would I tell the patient? I would say, okay, that one study, if the patient were familiar with that study, I would say, well, patients with EDS tend to report some issues, but if you look at it scientifically, that doesn't seem to support that idea. All right, uh, infertility, just a quick look at this. There were a lot of women who were infertile. The only point I wanna make here is this one right here. If you look at the causes where they could find a cause, they were pretty much the standard causes for infertility, including polycystic ovary syndrome and endometriosis. Now you could say, well, maybe there's a higher rate of endometriosis in Ehlers-Danlos, but the point is, don't assume that something about hypermobility Ehlers-Danlos is directly impacting fertility. Go through the normal evaluation to see if you can find the reason. So don't make assumptions. 
Um, so what should you do if you're, if you have, so we don't know the real rate of infertility in EDS. Uh, these other causes may be contributing. Again, don't assume anything, get a thorough evaluation and also watch for cervical incompetence over time during pregnancy. All right, what about uh, menses? So a lot of women have intermenstrual bleeding and heavy menstrual bleeding, and women report the fact that they have some uh, uh, interface between their menstrual periods and uh, their symptoms. So uh, a lot, there's a, a high report of these. This was a maybe more, a better study that showed that they did not find any postpartum bleeding, vaginal tears, or, or C-section associated with Ehlers-Danlos. Uh, they did find more spontaneous ab abortions, and they did find uh, quite a bit more bleeding. Um, now, if you do have flares that relate to menses, it might be worth trying uh, birth control. This shows that uh, some women improved on birth control and some women did not improve on birth control. If you have flares then that relate to menses, so influenced by menstruation, you're actually less likely to improve on birth control, which is paradoxic. Okay, structural issues, prolapse. Um, so prolapse, the, the bladder can prolapse anteriorly, the rectum can prolapse posteriorly, the uterus can prolapse right in the middle. And the question is, is there an association of prolapse with uh, EDS. So this study of Turkish women showed that yes, there is. If you have a higher Biden score, you are more likely to have prolapse. And the higher the Biden score, the more advanced the prolapse is. Uh, this is the study that was shown by uh, recently um, uh, before in the context of the bowel evaluations. Uh, and uh, you can see that there's a higher rate of fecal incontinence, uh, higher rates of some of these of urinary incontinence and incomplete urinary emptying. Um, probably this, the best study shows that there is a slightly higher rate of pelvic organ prolapse in uh, people that have uh, EDS compared to people that do not. So the answer to this question, I would say yes, it's small, but you are more likely to have prolapse if you, don't, if you have EDS. Um, uh, and the MOAS study, however, showed that that was not related to delivery. So if you deliver, you're not more likely than a person with IDES to have prolapse. You're just more likely to have prolapse in general. Uh, so why the difference in prolapse findings? Same issue. Looking forward versus looking backwards, different populations. So you can't just pick one single paper and draw a conclusion. Uh, so Treatment of prolapse and EDS, I would recommend things like Pilates, uh, Kegel exercises, uh, and then I'm just quoting Lise here and saying avoid exercises that put a load on the end of the range of motion uh, and avoid open chain exercises. So try some of the, uh, and see a pelvic floor physical therapist. Okay, actually, I'm done. <laughs>